And as loud as I want Woo! Why can't I praise him as loud as I want Why can't I praise him as loud as I want Why can't I praise him as loud as I want
circumstances do. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
don't have to prove anything there is room at your table for me i am no one you love i am no one I'll sing that again you, love. you take me just as i am you choose me all over sing it this morning. Declare it over your life in Jesus' name. Your love, your love. One more time, just the voices. Come on. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. You are the strength. You are our source. Woo! We love you. We pray right now for the rest of service and anointing over Pastor Troy. In Jesus' holy name, everyone said amen. Look to your partner and say, hey, you look pretty good. Pretty good. Give me a high five. Yeah, okay. All right, Ben. Good morning and welcome to Victory Church. We are so glad that you're here. We would love to get connected with you and there's three easy ways that you can do that. First of all, you can text the number right on the screen and fill out a digital connection card or you can reach right in front of you in the back seat pocket of that chair and fill out that connection card right there or you can scan the QR code and get connected. Victory, we love that we are such a generous church because it allows us to be used in the community and that's because of you and your faithfulness. So if you'd like to give today, there's three ways that you can do that. You can text the number on the screen to give. You can go to our website at tnvictory.com and give right there, or you can drop your tithe or offering on the way out in the bucket. Once again, thank you so much for being here. Let's find out what else is happening here at Victory Church. Good morning, good morning. My name is Zenobia, I'm the outreach director here, and I wanted to just give you some updates and um, info on some events that we got coming up. So, this Saturday, or coming up Saturday, yes, 
we have our kayak day. So if you have never kayaked, you want to try it out, you can. We're going to be at Long Hunter State Park. We have some rentals available if you do have a kayak. They even have canoes. So if you want to bring your family out, please come and join us out on the lake, 10 a.m., because you know it does get hot, so we want to start in the morning. I think it would be a great, for us, great day for us to get connected, so we hope to see you guys out there. Also, that following week, so two weeks from now, man, y'all got a baseball game coming up. Yes. So that would be July 30th, and that is the Nashville Sounds game. Y'all also will have a buffet. Y'all gonna be in the Vanderbilt picnic area, so it's a more private picnic area. So if you have not signed up, y'all time is running out. So I suggest y'all go on the website and please sign up. All the information will be available on the website. We hope to see you guys there. Next, we if you guys are interested, Southeast Community Day, will also be on the 30th. And that's here in Antioch. It's actually just across the street, across the road, across Bell Road. We would love to see you guys come out. That'd be a great way, Victory. We're gonna be out there just to showcase ourselves in the community. And they're gonna be doing a lot of back to school drives and stuff like that for the kiddos. So please, if you wanna get your face out there, represent Victory, represent us in the community since we are now here in Antioch, we would love for you guys to help volunteer with that. So we have more information about that on the website as well. And small groups. Guys, this fall, we will be launching small groups and we need leaders. Yes, y'all can praise for that. Thank you. We do need leaders and volunteers. So if you would like to lead a small group or if you just want to host and you know, give your home up for that small group, we would love to talk to you about that. We do have a QR code that you can scan in the lobby. And we would just like to chat with you about it. And I'll be at the Welcome Center after service. Please come and see me or Kyle or anyone else. And we would just love to give you more information about that. And guys, anything else about upcoming events, we do have the TV in the lobby that does show the upcoming events that's coming up. Please check that out as well. And once again, thank you guys for spending your Sunday with us. And please check out this video. It's Morpheus. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice. Alice? No, no. Her name is Darla. Darla. Let me tell you why you're here. I wish you would. You're here because you know someone. What you know you can't explain. Of course I can't explain it. What? It's... It's like inside my bones, like I can, I can feel it. You feel it. I just said that. You felt it your entire life. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. No. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. You are talking about at the movies, happening at Victory Church the entire month of August. Free popcorn, free Coke, free characters, Everything free and sermons mixed with movies. That's what we're talking about. Do you want to know what it is? I, I just told you what it is. Look, just plan to be there on August 7th and you're gonna have a great time. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, no one can be told. You have to see it for yourself. Man, look, I agree 100%. Everybody needs to experience at the movies for themselves. But real quick, can we talk a little bit about that pill you gave me? Like, does it do anything for abs? I'm just asking for a friend. Please, follow me. Okay, but wait, does that mean, hey, are you coming to at the movies or not? Morpheus, Morpheus. Hey, what's going on, Victory Church? Hey, are y'all excited for at the movies? Yeah, it's coming, it's coming. We're just a couple of weeks away. And in case this is brand new to you, this is something we do every year as a church. And the purpose of it for us 
is an evangelistic tool. What we want to do is we want to be able to bring people into the church who might not normally want to come to church so they can experience the gospel. Uh, as you heard me say, I do preach back and forth with movie clips. Every sermon is the basic gospel. It's an incredible opportunity. Free popcorn, free drinks. Uh, we'll have characters here that your kids can take pictures with or you can take pictures with. I don't know what you enjoy. Uh, but it's just a great time. So do me a favor. Invite people. We have uh, invites outside you can grab. You can leave people to our website. And there's a QR code that will take them to an At The Movies website where they'll get information about this series as well as they'll be able to register for a giveaway. Uh, we'll have a giveaway every week that they can register for. It also lets us know who's coming. And it's just going to be an incredible time. It'll be four weeks long. Um, I, I already know some of the movies, but I don't want to get... I'll give one of them away, all right? One of the movies I'm going to preach from is a movie that, uh, if you watch the movie, we don't talk about Bruno is what happens in the movie. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what that movie is? Uh, all right, just kidding. Just a few of us. Uh, it's the only cartoon movie I'll preach from. All right, the rest of them get pretty serious, but uh, you're going you're gonna to be pretty... I, I think you're going to enjoy the principles we bring from the movies. Again, it's just a great time, and uh, as you see, I'm doing my job. I invited Liam Neeson last week. Uh, I'm inviting Morpheus this week. You don't know who I'm going to invite next week, but you just do your part in inviting, get people in the building. Amen? Uh, if you're visiting with us, my name is Troy. My wife, Darla, and I get the absolute privilege to pastor this church, and uh, as you heard in the video, we'd love for you to connect with us. Fill out a connection card either in front of you or online, and let us know. we got a gift for you, and we'd love to reach out and connect and do our best to get you involved. And also, as always, thank you to all of our givers, those who support Victory Church, those who tithe and give offerings every week to what God's doing right here, not only inside of Victory, but outside of Victory. We're able to be so involved in the community. As Anobia said, at the end of this month, we will go to the uh, community day. We'll set up a table. We'll give out kids, uh, kids' school supplies to all of the kids that come because of your faithfulness to be able to give. We can do that free of charge, and we'll be able to tell people about the church and at the movies. And we're continuing as we've been here for a couple of months, and we're continuing to be able to reach out to the air, people who live in this area, and we're excited about it. And so we're excited about what God is doing. Do you agree? Yes. You ready for the word? Yes. Me too. Y'all been enjoying this series? Yes. Huh? Y'all been enjoying this series? All right, six of you. So we'll know, we know we got six people who will pay attention. Uh, uh, in case you are visiting with us, you haven't been here in a little, while, a little while, we've been preaching through the Beatitudes that are in Matthew chapter 5. So I'm going to read them real quick all the way through, uh, and then we'll get into the message for the specific Beatitude for today. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, you can turn to it on your phone, or you can just follow along with us on the screen. It says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up onto a mountainside and he sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He started off by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We talked the first week about the importance of learning to let go and let God. The world's telling us to tie a knot, hang on. God's saying, let go, poor in spirit. Went on to say, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And we talked about how God draws near to those who are heartbroken. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And we talked about the principle that God teaches us and willing to lay ourselves down so that other people can get up. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And we talked about how to hunger, not for the things of this world, but for the things of God. And as a result, we become righteous like Christ. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. We talked last week about we can show mercy because we've been shown mercy. Today, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want to talk to you today from this idea, the habits of a healthy heart how to have a healthy heart and the habits that provide that. I've shared before from the stage that my youngest daughter, Casey Ray, is a little bit of a fireball. She's redheaded, and from what you've probably heard, redheads tend to get a little crazy. Uh, but we always like to say she goes from zero to 100. Like, like there's really no in-between. Like, she kind of those sweet and sour commercials, you know what I'm talking about? Like, one moment she's really sweet, and she's just nice and playful, and then in the blink of an eye, she's like, I'll oh, kill everybody! Like, I mean... <laughs> probably her words like that's just how I mean and there, but what kills me is there's no progress you know it's not like hey daddy I love you and then you start to like slowly see her transform it's like this and then you got this like it's just that quick 
of a move. And it's funny because I sat down this week to study the concept of a pure heart, the concept of purity. And I really stepped back, and maybe you'll agree, I don't know how long you've been in church, but when I was a teenager, I got saved at about 17, 18 years old, and I got into the church. In those seasons of my life, Whenever we talked about purity and the concept of purity, I always felt like it went from zero to a hundred. I never really felt like there was a process in between. Like, I, like you were either like pure or you, won't, you weren't pure. Like, like, let me give you some examples. When I was growing up, you either like didn't do anything bad. <laughs> you didn't listen to, you know, bad music. You didn't watch anything but Christian PG movies. You didn't watch any bad TV shows. You didn't have any bad thoughts. You didn't, you didn't think about a girl. You didn't think about a guy. You didn't listen. Like, you know, it was all of this like purity living. And then it was that or you're going to hell. <laughs> like those were the only two options. You know what I mean? It was like, you are a hundred percent pure. You don't have a bad thought. You don't look at anything bad. You don't do anything bad or you're hell bound. Like, I remember I would be doing good, and then Eminem would drop a new album. I was like, well, there it goes, you know what I mean? There goes all the purity. You know, it just, it, just, it, just, it just felt like it was so easy to get from here to here. I never felt like there was a process. I never felt like it was, like, pure, eh, not so pure, less pure. Okay, now, you know, it just felt like it went from here to here. And when we hear Jesus say, blessed are the pure in heart, if we have been taught that purity is zero to a hundred, then when we hear pure in heart, we automatically assume that that can't be us. But when we read this beatitude, the very first thing that you and I need to notice is that Jesus is concerned for our heart. That's what he says, pure in heart. So many people think that Jesus is focused on external values, but what they have to understand is he's actually zoned in to the inside, because out of the heart, everything flows. The aim of Jesus, please listen to me, the aim of Jesus is not to fix the outside in hopes that it might impact the inside. The aim of Jesus is to go after the inside, knowing that it will then impact the outside. He understands that if he can all of a sudden make you do things, good things, but there's no real heart change, then you can only do good things for a while because eventually Eminem's dropping a new album. You know what I mean? You can only do good. But if he goes after the inside and the change is on the inside, then it's inevitable that it will flow out of you and begin to impact the outside. This is where the religious people of Jesus' day got it backwards. And to be honest with you, a lot of religious people today get it backwards. I told you at the beginning of this series that every beatitude that Jesus says is countercultural. That everything he said was going against what they were being taught in their culture. I would tell you that it's even the same today. Because here was the belief of the religious people in that day. They believed that it was your purity on the outside that allowed you to see God. They believed that when you were of perfection, you could see God. If it was up to them, and they were writing the Beatitudes, it would say, blessed is the one who portrays a good image. That's what they understood. So much that they took the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses, and they created over 600 rules. And you had to follow all of these rules like a checklist. And if you followed every rule down to each, if you just all the way down to the tiniest detail, then you were pure, and then you could see God. And Jesus flipped it on its head. And he stepped up and said, no, 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 no. Not blessed are the pure who follow all the rules, but blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Jesus did not come into this world simply because we had some bad habits that needed to be broken. Jesus came into this world because we have dirty hearts that need to be purified. That's why Jesus came. He didn't come so he could stop us from doing things that are bad. He came to purify dirty hearts. And as a result of purifying dirty hearts, 
we will find ourselves less likely to do those things that are bad because a change on the inside automatically impacts the outside. Listen to me. We cannot become pure in heart on our own. We can't do it ourselves. There is nothing you, nor your spouse, nor your family can do that will put you in a position where you will all of a sudden purify your own heart. The only way your heart is made pure is by God's grace that cleanses us and makes us pure in Jesus, who is righteous, who is pure, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so knowing that, Jesus steps up, and in Matthew 5, 8, he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That word pure there, if you were to define it, it would mean undefiled. Uh, It would mean that nothing has been added to it. It's pure. If you are currently into fitness and healthy eating and those kinds of things in our culture today, which have certainly become more popular and more and more normal, you'll hear these concepts where they'll say things like no additives, right? It's pure. It's pure. It's organic. It's all these things. And what they're saying to you is that whatever it was, it's natural. There's nothing that has been added to it to contaminate it. It is what it was meant to be. It is pure. When we are pure in heart, our heart has nothing added to it from this world. Our heart, listen to me, was made to have one allegiance. And that allegiance was to Christ alone. And a pure heart is a heart that doesn't have anything added to it. Its allegiance is to Jesus. And you would say, now wait a minute. If God has all of my heart, then what about my spouse and what about my kids? I would tell you that once your heart is all given to God, it impacts your love for your spouse. It impacts your love for your kids because it's Jesus who loves with a selfless love. And so while you think you have to break pieces of your heart off and give it to your spouse and give it to your kids and give it to God, when you give it all to God, God loves them back through you. Does that make sense? It's an allegiance thing. Our heart is allegiant to God. But here's my favorite part. As we love God, we grow in purity. Okay? You don't purify your heart. As you grow in God, as you grow in a relationship with Jesus, as you come to church, as you read your Bible, as you learn to pray, as you grow in God, you grow in purity. And as your heart becomes pure, you start to see God in everyday moments. Let me give you an example. Everybody in this room has experienced it. Do you remember the last time you were wanting to get a certain car? And you were looking out, and let's just say, I don't know, it was a red Volkswagen, right? And that's what you were going after. You wanted a red Volkswagen. You went and looked at it. You priced it. And then you decided not to buy it yet. And you left. And every day when you're driving around, what do you see? A red Volkswagen, right? Like everywhere you go, it's like it's insane. Everywhere you turn, there's another one. There's another one. And listen to me. It's not that all of a sudden... Everybody found out you were going to get a red Volkswagen, so they all ran out and got a red red Volkswagen. The reason was this. They actually do studies on this, and they say that we are going through life with this very vague perspective, especially with cars. You ever notice that when you look straight ahead, you don't see your nose? But you do. You close one eye, you see it there. Close one eye, you see it there. I'm getting very scientific on you right now. Y'all not ready for this. You're like, wow. But it's always there. So your eyes have learned to overlook it and not see it. When we're going through life, we're very vague, especially with vehicles. So even though the red Volkswagen is all over the place, you don't see it. But because now all of a sudden you want it, your focus is now zoned in on that car. And so now all of a sudden you see it there when it's always been there. You just weren't focused on it. So when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, he doesn't mean that you're going to see God in this literal, like, all of a sudden, whoo, there he is. What he means is now your heart is focused. You have a focused in heart. And because that heart is focused in, what used to be very plain, what used to be very vague, now is focused in, and you begin to see God in all these different areas. Listen to me. Someone who's pure in heart, 
sees God in relationships. Someone who's pure in heart sees God in their job. Someone who is pure in heart sees God when they're out shopping, when they get a parking space. Well, praise God. You know what I mean? When they're in Kohl's and all of a sudden they get a deal and the sweater that was $70 is like a nickel. And they're like, praise God. Favor ain't fair. (laughs) And I know that nowadays some people just say it as something that they say. But the more your heart becomes focused on God, the more you begin to see him in everyday moments. And so what Jesus is teaching us is when our heart is pure, when we're growing in God and God is purifying our heart, we will naturally begin to see him in moments that he was always there, but we didn't normally see him. This is what Jesus is talking about, that you and I, our hearts can be pure. God purifies our heart, and then we see God. But I want to be very clear about something, because if I'm not careful, you get up and you walk out of here, and you're like, all right, we got to purify our hearts. It's our job, and it's impossible for you to purify your own heart. I, I just made it very clear to you that God purifies your heart. It's you coming before God and saying, I would like to have a relationship with you. I'd like to, you know, you you to be my savior. And that relationship begins to happen. And that heart begins a process of purity. Doesn't mean that the moment you experience God, boom, it's a pure heart. You'll never make a mistake. That's not what that means. It means that now your heart is zoned in on God. And now you begin to see God in places you never saw God before. So God purifies our heart. It's his responsibility. It's not ours. But can I tell you what is our responsibility? There are things that you and I can do to help keep our heart focused on God. God, only God purifies the heart. But you and I are capable of doing things that will protect and help our heart to stay focused on God. And I want to give you three things real quick. If you're taking notes, take notes on these. Three things that you and I can practically do I always try, especially with this series, to leave you out of here with practical steps on how to take this word and apply it. These are three things that you can practically do to help keep your heart stay focused on God. Number one is this. You need to guard it. You got to guard it. One of the greatest things that you and I can do for a pure heart is to protect it. God is purifying your heart. Every time you come to church, every time you read his word, every time you sing a worship song, God is doing work on your heart and he's purifying your heart and he's allowing you to see God in things and the best thing that you and I can do is protect you ever been to an operating room in a hospital where they're doing surgery they are so protective next time you're at the hospital try to go walk into a surgery room just try to walk in it see what happens just be like hey I got a question pastor said just walk in and see what happens they won't allow it they protect it because surgery is happening for some reason in our culture today We are so good at protecting the wrong things, and we don't do good enough at protecting the right things. You know what I mean? We're so protective of all the wrong things, but when it comes to things that matter, we lack protection. For example, everybody who's here right now, when you left to come to church, you probably locked your front door. If you didn't, give me your address real quick. Let's just go see (laughs) See what kind of TV you're working with. You, you, you locked your front door. When you got out of your car to come into here, you locked your car. Everybody in here, who in here has a phone? If you have a phone, raise your hand if you have a phone. All right. How many of you lock your phone? Raise your hand if you lock your phone. All right. Yes. Remember when you were young and you locked your bike? Remember that? All of my fellow 37-year-olds, remember when we rode bikes and we locked them? For all my ladies, remember when you locked up your diary when you were young? We lock up things. Why do we lock our house? Why do we lock our car? Why do we lock our phone? Because we do not want people who don't deserve access to have access. So what we do is we value it so much that we, we give access to the ones that we want to have access. Which means people that you know have a key to your house. People that you trust have the code to your phone. Because you don't want just random people to be able to get access in areas that are sensitive to you. 
And this is what it means by guarding our heart. This is another area of our life where we can't just let anybody have access to. If you lock your phone, lock your heart. If, 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 if just anybody, if I went and grabbed your phone right now, Kyle, and I walked over and I handed it to Christine. You, you love Christine. She's an awesome woman of God, but she doesn't know your phone passcode because you don't want her posting on your Instagram. We're so sensitive. All of you would be like, don't, don't give them code to my Facebook. But anybody can have my heart. See what I mean? How twisted is that? It's a natural progression, y'all, that whatever we allow to fill our heart is going to eventually flow out into our lives. Whatever we allow in will eventually flow out, and it will show up in our actions. Here's how we say it from where I'm from. What goes in is going to come out. And you're just going to let anything go in? Because I preach on Sunday mornings, I watch what I eat on Saturday nights. Because I don't want to be up here with bubble guts. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so if I'm that sensitive, if I'm watching, because I know whatever goes in, <laughs> science and biology, come on now. <laughs> Who can do that in a sermon? And yet we need to guard our, the wisest man in the Bible outside of Jesus King Solomon wrote all of Proverbs, incredible wisdom about marriage, wisdom about finances, wisdom about leadership. And in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, he says this, above all else. That's his way of saying, if you didn't pay attention to anything else I said, listen to this. That's his way of saying, I said a lot of good stuff, but this is the best thing I'm about to say. Above all else, guard your because everything you do flows from it. The way you love your children flows from your heart. The way you love the people you're in relationship with flows from your heart. Your financial decisions flow from your heart. Everything flows from your heart. So King Solomon says, put a lock, put a passcode on it. Because everything you do flows from it, and you can't allow just anything to come into it. If everything we do flows from our heart, then guarding the condition of that heart should be of uttermost importance. Amen? In 2020, Darla and I went on vacation with Brian and Erica. Uh, COVID had kind of started to go down a little bit, so people were traveling, but everything was so affordable. You could get on an airplane and go somewhere for next to nothing. And so uh, we were recording the sermons on Thursday, and so for the first time in 15 years, I had the weekends off, and so we would go out of town and experience, and we're, we're out of town, we're in this hotel lobby. We're still having to wear masks, it's, it's at that level, okay? And I'm sitting on a chair in the hotel lobby, and Darla's sitting on my lap, and then Brian and Erica are standing up. Uh, probably, about, I've had a guest five feet away from us or so, and we're waiting to, I think we're fixing to go get something to eat, we're waiting or whatever, and there's like this Paul Blart mall cop, you know what I'm talking about? And he's there, and he walks over and he goes, hey, hey, hey y'all need to get six feet apart, six feet apart. And I assumed he was talking about Darla and I and Brian and Erica, so we were like, okay, I mean, like, we're good friends, but whatever, you know, and so, so Brian and Erica, you know, they kind of move a little bit more, and we're like, okay, you know, that, whatever, Paul, you know, they hope you like that. Some minutes go by, he comes back over and he's like, hey, I told you, I told you, y'all need to get six feet apart. And we're like, man, we are six feet apart. And he goes, no, no. And he points right at me and Darla and he goes, you two. Wait a minute. <laughs> Biology, okay? So I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I try to be meek, y'all, try to be meek. But stupid people bother me. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, sir. I started off real nice. I was like, let me, just, let me just explain it. You didn't know? This is my wife. I get it. You didn't understand. You thought I just met some stranger and let her sit in my lap. But I'm just letting you know, this is, this is, my, this is my wife. We, we, we have kids together. We have kids together. So if she ever has COVID, I have COVID. You know what I mean? Like, are we here? And he's like, I don't care. I was like, hold on, man. Look, I understand you probably aren't married. I don't know what kind of education is in the Paul Blart you know, cop school. And so let's just, let's talk about this. I said, last night, we shared a hotel room together. We, we went to sleep in the same bed together. It wasn't six feet apart. I said, tonight, we're going to go to the same hotel room together. 
and we're going to sleep in the same bed. Do you, can you connect the dots for a second? And he's like, I don't care. Brian had to come get me. He was like, look, we don't need the pastor going to prison while we're on vacation. <laughs> I was like, help me here. All I can say is, I was like, you're so petty. I was telling Brian about this. He was like, you know what? You was pretty petty. I was like, okay, we were both petty. But I'm like, this is so, what, a, what a petty officer, right? Like you understand who she is, so petty. I felt the spirit of God tell me, you need to be that petty about protecting your heart. You need to be that petty. Like, well, I don't know. You need to get away from me. Well, but they're family. No, no, you need to get away from me. You know what I mean? We have to be that petty about the protection of our heart. We've gotten way too loose about this. We've got to a point where we don't see the importance of it. And so we look the other way. The security guard is there occasionally. And the Holy Spirit is saying, listen to me, church. Become petty. Look at a person beside you and say, you need to be petty. You need to be petty. You need to be petty about the protection of your heart. Be petty. Well, they might get offended. I don't care. It's your heart. Because when you start suffering from anxiety, they're gone. you got to protect your heart. Be petty about it. Because here's why. When the devil comes to attack your heart, and he's met with your guard, and he walks away, he does not stay away. He doesn't, oh, oh, okay. They got Paul Blart at the door. They're going to have him there for a while. We're good. He comes back. Loneliness comes again. Depression comes again. Anxiety comes again. Insecurity comes again. Fear comes again. Pride comes again. It continues to come over and over and over. So you got to have somebody placed ready to protect it. How many of you, again, raise your hand if you got phones. Do y'all have one of those cases on your phones? You know what I'm talking about, like the otter boxes? You know what I'm talking about? When I got an iPhone, the newest one, it was a couple years ago, I don't know when it was, but I got the new iPhone, Darla said, you need to get a case for it. And I'm, I'm cheap, okay, in case y'all don't know, I'm very cheap. And so I said, well, how much does the cost, you know, case cost? And she said, it's like 20 bucks on Amazon. I'm like, 20 bucks? That's a lot of money. Like, you know, Bezos ain't getting my money. You know what I mean? 60-year-old and a 37-year-old body. And so I was like, I'm not doing it. Today, there's a case on my phone. Do you know why? Could you guess? Both. (laughs) I broke it, and Darla bought it, all right? I broke it. How many people got phones on their cases right now because they one time... Dropped it and broke it. We live in a culture that doesn't want to put a case on it till after it's been broken. And the Holy Spirit is telling you, guard it now. Put an otter box on it now because something is going to try to break your heart. Something is going to attack it. And if you're dumb like me, you'll wait until you break it once. And you have to go through all that it cost you to get it fixed again. I felt the Lord tell me guarding our heart will never become a priority until we hate what it does to us more than we like what it does for us. I got off of Instagram a couple years ago because I hated what it did to me more than I liked what it did for me. And for some of us, there's relationships There's hobbies. There's things that we are doing that God is saying you need to guard your heart from that. And if we're not careful, the only thing that's going to ever push us to guard it is when we hate what it's done to us more than what it can do for us. So it's our responsibility to guard our hearts. But how do we do that practically? I'm basically telling you, you need to examine everything that's going into your heart. My wife is the best at this. We have a 12-year-old daughter, incredible woman of God. She's amazing. And the world is coming at her with everything. You need to be on TikTok. You need to have Instagram. You need to do this. You need to watch that. You need to do this. 
And she'll come to us because she's amazing, and she'll say, Mom, Dad, can I, can I watch this or can I do that? And my, my wife will go, I'll look into it. <laughs> Sorry, I just... She does all the investigation, and she comes back, and she'll say, yep, you can, you can do it, or no, you can't. She's guarding her heart. You imagine if we got that way about our own heart? Hey, did you see this new show? Hold on, I need to check it out first. Got to guard it. Got to guard it. Hey, you hear this song? Hold on. I got to guard it. Hey, I need you to get a part of this conversation. Let's get off of phone and music for a minute. I want to introduce you to somebody. Hold on, I need to guard it. Hey, listen to this gossip. Hold on, I need to guard it. It's our responsibility to guard our heart. Second is to hide it. So number one, you guide it, or guard it, sorry. Number two, you hide it. A healthy heart, this is really good, you need to listen to this. A healthy heart is not one that avoids attack. It's one who knows where to hide once it is attacked. Your heart being healthy isn't because it's going to avoid attack. Let me just let you in real for a secret real quick. All of you that think following Jesus means you're never going to experience, listen, somebody's going to do you dirty. The question is not, will my heart be attacked? It will be attacked. It's where will you run once it is attacked. Sometimes it's not about what you're running from, but where you are running to. It's not about what you're leaving, but where you're going. My kids, one day, Darla and I were at home, and they wanted to play hide-and-seek in our house. We got a little townhouse, two floors, nothing, not a mansion, you know? So hide-and-seek was going to be interesting, but Darla and I are very competitive. And so when they were like, let's play hide-and-seek, I'm like, well, you better get ready, because you ain't finding me, you know what I mean? Like, I'll give you one, you know, and the word, I'll give you one, you can swing by yourself, you know what I mean? Like, I'll give you one, I'll hide behind a curtain, but then after that, you ain't finding me. And so it came time for our turn, and nobody had said the garage was off-limits. And so I knew that. And so Darla at the time had this little Nissan Versa car, and it was in the garage. And I went into the garage, closed the door, left the light off, went, opened up the back door, crawled into the back seat, and, like, fell off into, like, you know, where your feet go in the seat. And I was just in there like this. Yeah. <laughs> but nobody could see me because my plan was even if they open the garage door and turn on the light, they're going to just look because, you know, they're kids, you know. They're just going to be like, he ain't in there. You know how they look for stuff in the refrigerator? You know what I'm talking about? Um, and so I, was like, I wasn't worried about that. So I just was stuck. Look, they never found me. Three or four times I saw the light come on in the garage. They come in, Mom, I could hear their little voices. Mommy, we don't know where Daddy is. I'm like, because I'm the champion. You know what I mean? Like, I'm Daddy. I get the big piece of chicken. You know what I mean? You're not finding me in hide and seek. Like, it was, it was amazing. I loved it. They couldn't find me. When things get difficult, we all have a place that we run to. But where you choose to hide is what makes the difference. Every one of us have a place that we run to. But where you are running to to hide is what makes the difference. The psalmist in Psalm 32, verse 7, he said this, For you are my hiding place. I love that. The Lord, you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. This is one of my favorite parts. You surround me with the songs of victory. You surround me. Now, Father, I'm not running here. I'm not running. Father, I'm running to you. You are my hiding place. Tune in for a second. Look at me for a second. I got a question from, for you straight from the Holy Spirit. What's your hiding place? When stuff starts happening... When, when all of a sudden nothing goes your way and the relationship ends before you thought it would, when you lose the job, when you thought you were finally starting to get ahead of things and get ahead of the bills, and now all of a sudden you find out, you, didn't, you know, when you apply and you find out that they chose somebody else, when you take the test and do all the work to, and all of a sudden find out that you're not having the baby you thought you were going to have, when, when these things happen, when the attack happens, where do you run and hide? Do you hide in social media? Do you hide in people's opinions? Do you hide in isolation? Do you hide in food? It's a real thing. I used to do it. Do, do you hide in certain beliefs, certain religious beliefs? Do you hide in your emotions? 
last time something happened to you that was unexpected? The last time you thought God was going to go that way and life went that way? When you were disappointed? When you were let down? When the person who you never thought would do you wrong did you wrong? When you just knew God told you he was going to give you something and he never showed up? Where did you go to hide? careful that we aren't running to hide with the same enemy that's attacking us. If we're running from a lack of self-security, we can't run to social media. If you were hurt in this relationship, you can't run to another relationship. This is what's happening in our culture. It's why we're all dysfunctional, because we're all running back and forth to the enemy that's attacking us to begin with. We get attacked here, we run over here. And surprise, it's the same problem. You ever had a problem in a relationship and you went to another relationship and there was that same problem? Do you know why? Because you're running to the same problem to help you from the problem. And the psalmist said, no, 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 listen to me. You are the place I hide. I told you I was in that versa. I fell down in the feet part of the versa. Three times they came in the garage looking for me. But watch this. I got stuck. Not lying. So now I'm all uncomfortable. I'm all twisted up like an Annie Ann's pretzel, you know, in the car. And I'm like, this is uncomfortable. And then I had to pee. You know how you find a good hiding spot? And as soon as you find a good hiding spot, you're like, oh, gosh. So I'm in the car. I'm stuck. I had to pee. And all I could think about was this. I wish they would find me. Because I didn't want to give up my hiding place, you know what I mean? But I was ready to be found. What happens when our hiding place becomes so bad that we would rather be found than continue to hide? I got a better one for you. Some of us are stuck in the place we went to hide. God, something happened and, and we, we were attacked, our hearts were attacked, and we ran somewhere because we didn't know where to go. So instead of running to God, we ran to something else and we hid there and now we're stuck there. And we don't know how to get out of it. And it's not helping. It's not helping our heart, but we keep doing it because we're stuck and we stay in it. And every time an attack happens, we stay in it. And here you are wishing, I'd rather just be found than to stay in this place so tired of being stuck here. Nothing's ever helping. And the Holy Spirit says, run to him. Run to him. Get out. I walked in the house. I was like, girls, here I am. They were like, damn, we couldn't find you. I was like, I know, but I had to get out of that car. I was dying. Somebody this morning, you just need to say, God, here I am. I got to get out of that because I'm dying. And when something happens, I want to have a good hiding place for my heart. We must hide in God's word and in his promises. God is our special fortune. And whenever life overwhelms us, listen to me, you can always run to him. Always. No matter what you're going through. So number one, you need to guard your heart. Two, you need to hide your heart. Number three, you need to quiet your heart. Quiet. This one was my favorite one, so I saved it for the ending. Because I, I just was wondering for a second, am, am I the only one with a noisy heart? You know what I mean? Like, just, just noisy. Like, the anxiety that I get and all of a sudden I know something's up to me and it's got to go a certain way and I've got to lead it and I start to get this anxiety in my heart or the fear something's not going to go the way I thought it was going to go or everything's going to fall apart or I'm not going to be able to reach the potential that I thought God wanted me to reach and I start to feel the fear sometimes it's the uncertainty but sometimes it's not even something bad it's the passion you know what I mean like it's, it's just the noise of my heart I don't know about you, but sometimes my heart is so noisy that it impacts how I see. 
we'll be driving with Darla's dad, my father-in-law, and they'll have music up going, the kids will have music, and he'll go, turn down that music, I can't see. I love that. But it's so true. Sometimes our heart is so no noisy, we can't see. And so we start making bad decisions. Decisions we would have never made if our heart was quiet. But our heart's so noisy that we can't focus. And so we start to make wrong decisions. If we're not careful, this culture will get us to a place, watch this, where noisy becomes normal. And peace feels foreign. Could you imagine being in a place where noisy is normal? Peace is foreign. I go to restaurants and stores now, and young people are in there and they got their AirPods. In. It's not even young people anymore, it's adults. They're shopping, doing their thing, and they got AirPods in their ears. And part of that is because they just want entertainment, but the other part of it is I think they can't be alone with their own thoughts. Darn and I started watching this show called Alone, where they put people out in the wilderness and they're survivalists. And everybody who's quitting talks about this. They can't get away from their thoughts. Because a noisy heart is driven by a noisy mind. And they kind of help each other. And we're trying to operate in life with noisy hearts and noisy minds. And we don't quite know what to do. And so we stay busy so that we don't have to ever actually sit with us. Because if I sit with me, then I'm going to learn everything about me that I don't want to admit. And I'm going to start feeling bad about myself and think all these things about me instead of realizing that it's the grace of God that covers that. It's the mercy of Jesus that we talked about last week that forgives me of that. But we don't want to do that, so we'd rather turn up the volume and allow the heart to be noisy. I hear more people tell me about how noisy their heart is instead of ever asking, how do I quiet it to begin with? Because we're afraid that if we quiet it, then we got to be in the room with ourselves. But here's what I know about the power of God. If you give him your heart, not only will he quiet it, but he'll help you deal with you. Paul sits down and he gets ready to write this letter to the church of Philippi. It's called the book of Philippians. We took it, we divided it into chapters and verses. So you'll find it in chapter 4, you'll find it in verses 6 and 7. But here's what he wrote. He sat down talking to a whole group of Christians who have noisy hearts. He sits down and he pins, do not be anxious. We go home right now, right? That's the word we all need. But it's not enough. Do not be anxious. But in every situation, everybody say every. What well, does God care about whether or not I get into that college? Every situation. Does God care about whether or not I can find a spouse? Every situation. Does God care about whether or not we're going to have children? Every situation. What about my father? Every situation. Do not be anxious, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. So I, it's my request mixed with my praise. It's my problem mixed with my praise. Still got a reason to praise. What's my reason? Because Philippians tells me I can go to God with my problems. But hey, let's not just go to God with our problems. Let's go to God with our hearts. With every prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the what? Peace of God. But here's, man, this is it's so rich, which transcends all understanding. Which means, even though it doesn't make sense to you, it's still peaceful. Well, God, peace for me is having a job and I've applied seven times and I haven't got peace that transcends all understanding. I always try to understand God. Well, if you do it like this, and God's like, would you stop? Peace that transcends all understanding. Here we go. Get ready. Guard your what? Heart. And your what? Mind. In Christ Jesus. Peace that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and it will guard your mind because it knows that your mind and your heart are working together. And he knows that it's noisy and you're 
anxious and you're worried and you're uncertain and you're mad and you're sad. And the Holy Spirit says, if you will just bring your requests to God, he'll give you peace and he'll handle the situation. I told you that Casey Ray goes from zero to a hundred. Just blah, you know, Chucky doll running around the house. Side note, if you were here last week, I talked about that little stupid my buddy doll, right? Casey's in Memphis right now with my grandparents. She has adopted the doll. Sent us pictures. Got that stupid thing on her hip like it's her child. <laughs> Going down. Let that thing make it back to Smyrna. It'll be over. Sorry, sometimes feelings just come out on stage. But well, one day, she, she blows up. She was crazy. She told me and Darla one day, she said, I made this place to go to. I said, what are you talking about? She said, under her bed, she had put up all of these drawings and pictures, and she had surrounded it with all of her stuffed animals. And she had a, a, a certain book that she liked, and then she had the uh, uh, music going. So, so watch this. Sorry, I got to grab the picture for a second, but I had to show this to you. I forgot to grab it earlier. So she has this little spot in her room she talked about. She called it her peace cave. And she was like, whenever I get mad or I start to blow up, she said, I'll just go upstairs and I'll get into my little peace cave. And around me will be all these drawings I've drawn, my favorite book and my stuffed animals, and I'll play music. And she's like, I'll just calm down in there. At seven years old, here's what she was saying. I found out how to quiet my heart. The Lord brought that back to my memory and I got this picture that if you and I, let's just try this. You might not be able to read it. I'll read it to you. But I just thought this might be pretty cool if we could make it happen. If we could figure out a way to create an environment, right? Be able to create an environment. Hypothetically, maybe, maybe realistically, actually, physically, God will turn it into something good because he loves me. Whatever you're going through, God will turn it to good because he loves me. God picked me. Don't panic. He's with me. He will give me strength and he will help me. God will take care of everything I need. God is my helper so I won't fear. What can people, I love, it says, what can mere people do to me? What if we created this area that we could come to and we had these reminders of what God's promised us and we had this book that God gave us, that is a love letter to us. And when our hearts got loud, we could come into it, sit down. I forgot the music. Scout, give me some music. I can be real with you.
ourselves in all of this insecurity, if we could find a place that we could go to. And I don't know that it has to be a cave under your bed, but maybe it needs to be. And you could go to it, and you could have reminders of what the Word says about you. And you could have the book where God wrote His love letters to you. And you could have the music playing that's reminding you of who you are to Him. going to keep moving forward in a world that is full of anxiety, you better find a way to make sure that your heart stays focused on God. And the word's very clear. You need to guard it. You need to hide it. You need to quiet it. But can I just kind of give you a sense of relief and let you know that you don't have to do that by your own ability? That if you'll just set up a way for you to get into the presence of God, you'll guard it. It's the place you can hide it. He'll quiet it. Here's the most interesting part about Casey Ray's cave. She made it about a year and a half ago. She's never once gotten in it. She's had plenty of explosions since then. But she's never once went to it. Let's not be someone who has a cave, a place that we can go for peace and never visit it. Let's not keep letting these things destroy our marriages and our homes and our hearts when the entire time we have a place that we can run to, but we never run to it. Pastor, where do I start? We start, first of all, just coming to church, hearing the Word, getting a Bible, which we have if you want one, reading your Bible, praying, listening to worship music, doing whatever you can do to stay in the presence of God, because when you're in the presence of God, your heart becomes pure, and when your heart is pure, you see God. Amen? Would you stand with me for a moment? salvation, and then the other for those of you that you have a noisy heart. So Chris, I want to invite just some prayer partners down for a moment. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, the Bible says you can believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and you'll be saved. You can do that today. You can do that. We can walk you through that whole process. So that's one thing that can happen this morning. But here's the other thing. If you're in here and you're dealing with anxiety, dealing with depression. Your heart is noisy because of something that's happening. We would love to pray with you. We'd love to, the Bible talks about when two or more are gathered, he's there. We'd love to agree with you, put a hand up to you and pray for you. So I'm going to pray. Worship team, let me invite you guys up. Sorry, go ahead and come up. I'm going to pray. And they're going to begin to sing. And we invite you to come down. Again, whether you Do me a favor if you don't come down for prayer. Start asking yourself how you can put into practice some of these practical things so that you can have a healthy heart. God purifies it, but he gives us the wisdom. Acting. As Solomon said, that above all else, we guard our hearts. Father, I pray right now that you would help us go on how to keep it focused on him. If you need more help, I'd love to talk to you after service, maybe give you a little bit of direction. Guard our hearts. As the psalmist said, that you become our hiding place. I pray we will run to you. As we should. But let's not have a cave of peace and never use it. Amen? Philippians says that we would not be anxious, but trust everything to you and find peace and mind in our hearts. Father, we thank you right now for your word. It's alive. It's life-changing. It's impact. I pray we would do that. I pray for every person in this room right now. Number one, for those that might not be saved, that they would give their heart to you and experience salvation through your grace and your mercy. That you love them, as Scout has sung about this morning. Second, for the person in here whose heart is noisy, they came in here dealing with some anxiety, dealing with some heartache, some depression, some confusion, some uncertainty. Father, whether they come down for prayer or not, that I just pray you would touch them like only you can do. My favorite
favorite thing to say is I can preach your word, but I can't change a life. But Father, you can. People can leave today different than they came in, and that'll be because of you and your Holy Spirit, your grace, your mercy. So have your way in this place, we pray. In Jesus' name. Just as I am, you choose me all over again. I am the one you love. I am the one you love. I don't have to prove anything. There is room at your table for me. Thank you, Jesus.